50 gram fingering weight yarn. That's got a bit of fluff. I hope that's fluff and not. And we'll, say we'll to some that. fishermen, can we borrow these ropes? Well, no, no, no. Sling no, them no. over. We buy the ropes. We're not going to buy the yes, ropes. Yes, yes. What we do is. What we, are we going to do with the ropes? We afterwards? both buy the ropes. We don't so before we do that, of course, we need to get out of this pouring rain that is now coming down and get into the kitchen and dye up. But in opposite. In opposite. Does that sound right? But you know what I mean. We're doing it the other way round. Frosty woodland and all those kinds of Oh, stop of it. You're tempting me. Frosty woodland. What? It's making my heart sing. A bit of coloured fluff got in. That was a bit of a worry. I thought there was a bit of dye in that, in that soaking. Um, what is this? Bowl. Words. Yeah. Look, what am I knitting? Very deep conversations. Today's most excellent. <laughs> One, two. Welcome, everybody, to the Bakery Bears video show featuring my favourite blanket. Yes. And it's a momentous it occasion. Is. It is. Because after many months of increases and fancy business, yeah. it's the decreases. We're on to the decreases. Oh my goodness. We're on the home straight. Yes. Now, fear not because the home straight is quite long. It is. Four months. <laughs> so if you're like me, if you really don't like finishing projects and you like to enjoy the process, fear not because you will be enjoying the process Pretty much for the next, well, not quite four months. Not quite four months. Three months. Yeah, Octo and sort of towards the end of October we'll finish it. Yes. Yeah. But my goodness, what a show we have in store today, because not only do we have a brand new My Favourite Blanket, but also you're launching, well, you've launched a pattern. I have, I today have. Today is the official launch. Yes. Because last time, you may recall, we mentioned the documentary series that we produced last year called Walking the Wall. Well, in the course of us producing that series and me going and filming and talking to Kay about it, you got all inspired, didn't you? I did, you? I did. I and did. you designed? I designed Dan a cowl to knit that was inspired completely by Dan's journey along Hadrian's Wall, so it's the Hadrian's Cowl. And that was just, a, the you, it was just initially the sort of working title, but it kind of stuck and it seemed right just to leave it with yeah. that name. Yeah. So yeah, it's the Hadrian's Cowl and there's different motifs on it, it's colour work, and there's different colour work motifs on there that reflect different parts of the wall. It, yeah, so it, I'll be showing you that in what's off my needles. Well, no... Oh, I'll no. be showing you that. Sorry. In what's off my needles. I do apologise. I'm just so used <laughs> because, to it being yes, me. <laughs> forget about my favourite blanket. Forget about the launching of a pattern. How very dare you. I've actually cast something off. Yes. Woohoo. Yes. <laughs> Can you believe it? It's finished something. And it just was the most, the, the whole process was marvellous. It was just the most. It's my favourite ever colour work project. Definitely, definitely. Oh, that's really kind. Because the yarn was perfect, the yeah, design was yeah, amazing, yeah. everything about it. And it looks stupendous it, on. It's so fabulous. You've, I keep telling you, don't I? Because it's been sat on the back of my chair for a little bit. And I, every time I look at it, I just have to tell you what a fantastic job he's done with the colour work. It's just amazing. And I'll well, show you. You're very kind. Dan will show you. And also <laughs> as well... For those of you who are wondering how I approach colour work, I've actually produced, with Kay's help, a little video. We put it out, I think, about a year ago, yeah. and it's there for our Baker Bear patrons to yeah. watch. And I share with you, because I sort of went down all different pathways, got really obsessed. Still learning, by the way, still learning. But you came never up, stopped, do you? No. Came up with some definite techniques which absolutely work. And what's so great about these techniques is they work with yarn that's good for colour work and they also work just as well with yarn that's not good for colour mm, work. Mm. It's sort of like a foolproof way of knitting colour work and always producing. Keeping a, an even tension. That, yes. was, that was your aim, wasn't it? It's my obsession. Yeah, because a lot of people, you know, there's a lot of talk with colour work, isn't there, about yarn dominance. And that really is all to do with the size of your stitches. Yeah. You get yarn dominance because one colour is like the stitch is slightly different to the other colour so it tends to jump out but if you if you get your tension completely even then there shouldn't be any yarn dominance so that's been Dan's mission yeah 
And at the end of the day, if there's a way of approaching knitting colourwork where there is no yarn dominance, surely that's what you would want to do. Well, I don't know. I don't know, really. Each to their own, isn't it? You know, if you're happy with the way that you work colour work, it works for you, then that's fine, isn't it? Yeah, but what I'm saying is, you know, if there's a way of producing colour work where it's a lovely... Even, yeah. yeah I, suppose then... if, I suppose if you buy a colour work jumper or something, then it would be even, wouldn't it? Because it's worked on a machine and the tensions will all be the same. Oh, damn. <laughs> no, no. I just, but when course. something's handmade, it tends to have that, more of that, you know, that handmade touch to it. So in the case of, of colour work, it tends to be that yarn dominance thing. Yes. <laughs> homemade. What? It looks homemade. I didn't that, mean that in a derogatory way I do. at all. I do. No. Because, I, no, no, I really do believe quite passionately that knitting gets a bad rap and it gets a bad rap from a lot of people. It does, that's Because they true. associate knitted projects with the, the Lesser things. Lesser quality. Yes, yes. And it's just so untrue. It's the opposite, it's isn't it? It's completely untrue. It's completely the opposite. So all I'm ever trying to do is to represent the art form, which we all love, mm. to its highest possible standard. That way then when someone sees it, there's a chance that they might, first of all, be inspired to wear a knitted, yeah, you know, a hand-knitted yeah. garment, because a lot of people just won't do that. And secondly, they might even want to give it a go. They might want to give it a go. And then, yeah. my goodness, yeah. it's the perfect the perfect solution. Yeah, you get a lovely yeah. finished item. I, mean, I, I would love to give your cow to someone who's a, not a knitter and yes. has never experienced knitting. Yes. And just say to them, you know, do you think this is a bought item or do you think it's been handmade? And Th- see that could be say. a quiz. It would be cool. Oh, yeah. But you'd need to. Everybody here to... knows. We can't ask any of you. No, I'm thinking with sort of other items. You know, if there would be a way of, that would be just so cool. Yeah. I'd love was. Yeah. I think we'd probably be all right. I think we, we'd be able to spot what's what's hand knitted. I I I'm pretty good at spotting things yeah. that are hand knitted. You know, when we're watching things, sometimes I'll be like, "Oh, I think that's hand knitted." Now look, <laughs> yeah. summer is properly here, and get ready for a shocking statement. It's been glorious. Well, it's unbelievable. Utterly glorious. After last year's, was it 40 degrees? Oh, it was. After last year's 40 degree utter disaster, <laughs> this year it's like going back in time. I'm 14 again. Yeah, I'm outside we, playing with my friends and the weather. In the cool drizzle yes. of a summer. Yeah, I mean, we are really embracing this summer because this oh. is really unusual. That You know, certainly the way that summers have gone the last few years, it's been horrifically hot. We're certainly not counting our chickens. We're not counting our chickens, but... We've had the last few weeks of being cool, very wet. It's pouring down today. And just, you know, temperatures have been unbelievable for, for summer. Touch wood, now, it will continue. Such wood, it will continue for us. We know that across the world that hasn't been the case. And there's been some terrible, terrible heat situations across the world. So I have no clue why we've kind of got away with it this year. But well, because some countries are hot and some aren't. Yeah, but I and think this it's to do with the, I think it's something to do with the placement of the jet stream or something. Yeah, well, I, cle- I don't there was clearly know. a problem last year because never in my life have I seen forty degree temperatures no, in the no, UK. No, no, it, it was absolutely terrifying, really terrifyingly hot, and that has been repeated across Europe and across America, sort of right now. You yeah. know, recently, as, yeah. as you will have, a lot of you will be experiencing. So I'm really sorry, and I hope you're all okay. Put the but blankets away. We've, we've been very Get much embracing... Get out the lovely cotton sheets. I know, yeah. But in terms of us here in the UK, we've, we've been, as you can imagine, we've been loving it. Now, did you hear there a moment ago I said touch wood? Touch wood, yeah. Now, that is an interesting phrase. It's something that's been said my whole life by people, mm. and you hear it all the time, and I didn't know... W- I, well, I know what it means. It means hopefully my hopefully, good luck will continue. Don't, don't tempt fate. It's that kind of thing, isn't it? But where does it come from? Mm, I don't know. Well, it, it, its history is an interesting one. It, it, some people think, and I suspect that this is probably where it originally comes from, there was a feeling back in pagan times, before the rise of Christianity and the modern religions, that everything had gods attached to it, and trees were particularly mm. sort of poignant mm-hmm. to this day. People yeah, go and put yeah. ribbons around trees, and mm. I think that harks mm. back to those pagan rituals. And so it's thought that it was seen as good luck to touch a tree because it connected you to the god that was within the tree. Brilliant. But that 
sort of tradition carried on and it's thought actually that the modern tradition of of saying Mm -hmm. touch wood comes from the time really it's medieval times right on the sort of monastery you know the rise of the monasteries period there were people uh, who used to travel around the country called pardoners and you could pay them and they would pardon you for sins you could pay them even more money and they would give you what they claimed were real life Christian relics. Mm. And in the, now, this, this may have happened it in other... It sounds like a very profitable yeah, business, yeah, yeah. I know. doesn't it? Well, what I was going to say was this may have happened in other religions as well, but I know for a fact that this was done particularly with Christianity, and what they used to claim was, they used to claim that they could sell you a piece of the real cross. Oh. Now, of course, <laughs> right. of course, they just popped out into the woods, chopped up a bit of wood, <sighs> you know, come into town, oh, look... Give me a few pounds and here you are. Here's a piece of the real cross. So what people would do, this became particularly popular in times of the plague. Right. And people would buy a piece of the real cross. They would keep it in their pocket. Oh. And if ever they felt like they were in danger or they were going to potentially be yeah. in a situation where they could do with a bit of luck, yeah. they would touch the wood of the real cross right. in their pocket. Right. Hence the phrase touch wood. Gosh. Now in Ireland, it's different. Right. Right. In Ireland, a tradition arose, and this again is in in pagan times, that cut wood, the god had disappeared from it, and evil spirits had gone into it. Right. So the Irish, they don't touch wood, the Irish, they knock on wood. So that... And the reason why they knock on wood is they're getting rid of the evil spirits from that piece of wood. So the only time you should ever knock on wood is if it's a piece of cut wood. Right. Never knock on a piece, you know, on a tree right. because the God will still be in the tree. Right. But a piece of cut wood, yet yeah, if you're of Irish descent, and that's actually why in America yeah. it's become knock on wood yeah. because obviously there was an awful lot of, of Irish, Irish migration yeah, to America yeah, yeah. and that's why knock on wood took off in the US and touch wood is what? popular in the did, UK. Did you just have this knowledge in your head? How did you know I was going to say touch wood? Did you you just... didn't say touch wood. Oh, did I not? I said touch wood. Oh, you, s- oh, you and said... And then you oh, followed right. me. Okay, yes. okay. It's very interesting, isn't it, the history of things like that? Words so. in particular. Yeah. Um, now, it's fascinating. It is really fascinating because all of these traditions led to a game in Victorian times with children called Tiggy Touchwood. Oh, right. Now, I don't quite know how that game worked because I didn't re- research that. Right. But all of those traditions of, of touching wood led to you, this Tiggy yeah. Touch Wood game. Well, Tig is, is a very old game, isn't it? It Every, is. Everybody plays Tig in the playground. And and what so if what if base what if base was a was wood? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you, you, you can't... I'm on base, I'm safe. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> That's more than enough waffle. It is. Because I have a finished project to show you later on in this show. So to get to that, we've got lots to get through before do, that. And there's some do. exciting things to see, let there me is, tell you. So is. without further ado, I shall ask Kay Jones, what's on your needles? Yay! I'm very excited today about my projects. The first one I've got to show you is a pair of socks, and I absolutely love these. I've nearly finished them. Oh, I was knitting away like crazy trying to finish these and I just failed on the finish front. But I'm still going to show you because they're fabulous. So it's my scrappy fairground socks. Do you remember these? Aren't they lovely? These socks are, as you can see, they are using little scraps and leftovers of yarn. And it's my fairground socks pattern. And I've done three repeats. I think I said that last time. I know because people would be interested how many repeats I've done to get this thickness of a stripe. I've done three repeats of the pattern, changed yarn, another three repeats. And I wanted to create a pair of socks that had a kind of wintry forest feel. I don't know when I started these, but I mean, we're through July now, aren't we? But I, I was predominantly knitting these in July. So I wanted a bit of that Christmas in July feeling going on. So I wanted sort of greens, like foresty greens, pale blues and speckleds and anything that kind of reminded me of sort of frosty woodland and all those. Kind oh, of stop it. You're tempting me. Frosty what? woodlands. What? It's making my heart sing. Why? I'm just thinking about yes. it. Yes. But yeah, these, I mean, I absolutely love these socks and the other one is just as as lovely. I've used different scraps, so I haven't repeated, well, I say I haven't repeated a a 
a, a yarn, but the only time I have repeated it, like for this sock, I've used the same one for the cuffs, heels and toe. And it's so that I can have 12 yarns. Is that right? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Yes. The reason I did that is because I wanted these to have an advent feel. So I've used 12 different yarns in each sock. So altogether I've got 24 different yarns. So it's like a little advent project as well. And you could do this, you know, with this pattern or with any sock, to be fair. You could do this, you know, you could produce your own advent calendar without actually having to buy anything, which I think is great. Why are you laughing? Because, of course, you've done a video tutorial on how to I do have, this. I have. I have done a video. And it's in the show notes below. I have done a video on how you can produce a pair of Advent socks using your own leftovers and scraps. So that it's a really economical way of giving yourself a beautiful Advent calendar. And, I, to, you know, in all honesty, I've had as much enjoyment knitting these socks as I have any advent calendar that I might have opened through the years it's for me it's more choosing the yarns and it's the knitting that little bit every day and you can do that with your own yarns can't you you, you know you don't have to spend a fortune on calendars if that's not what you want to do you know so first sock all done second sock almost done I'm right at the end of like colour, that 11th, so I'm, I'm here, I'm in this little stripe here on my second sock and I just couldn't get it finished but, so I'm working these on double points as well and let me tell you I'm fully back in the double point mode. Welcome home. <laughs> I know, yeah. We're it does we're feel, glad to have you. It does feel a bit like that, I've got to say. Here is my second sock. So in this one, I chose a gorgeous pale, pale pink for the cuff, heel, and then the toe. And then we've got the same thing, all of these sort of leftovers and scraps, all the way down to the, to the toe. So I'm just on that last colour now, which is a lovely blue and then I'll be doing the toe. My favourite yarn, and I've kept it out because when I was knitting it, I was like, this is the prettiest mini. It's this one here, right after the heel. If I hold this up, can you see the one that's right after the heel there? Oh, it's so pretty. And it's like a mix of blues and like a, a mauvey purple a little bit of sort of cream, pink. It's absolutely gorgeous. And I'm sure, this is the mini. I'm sh pretty sure that this is a Sherry Iris and it's just so gorgeous. And I only use each of these little stripes uses like, I don't know, two, three grams. It's not a lot at all. Cause I've still got about, I think it was nearly 18 grams of this. And I find that mini skeins can generally weigh a little bit heavier than 20 grams. They might be sort of 21-ish, 22 grams. So I think each of these stripes is probably around three grams. But I need to do something with this mini. It's just so gorgeous. And I think what I might do is pick out two other minis so that I've got... I'd have nearly 60 grams there, wouldn't I? And I might make myself a little pair of stripy mitts and I think I might put the fairground pattern just on the top of the hand. I think it would be super pretty. So I've kept that one out because I didn't want it to get just lost in my huge box of sort of leftovers. So yeah, I'm just loving these and I'm gonna finish these off in the next couple of days. So I'll show you them all blocked and finished next time. You know, there, there are ends to weave in I've already woven them in on this one. And I know that a lot of people like to do the sort of weaving in as you go thing. I know there's the really popular weaving Stephen, isn't there, from Stephen West. I haven't tried that method, but in all honesty, I've watched it, I've seen what he does, and in all honesty, it's, it's just not for me. I, I just don't feel that it's securing the yarn quite enough for me. And also, it looks a little bit bulky. I don't mind, generally, I don't Didn't mind. Did you watch a video events. where someone compared? I did, I did. I like to watch, I can't remember the name of his channel, but his name's Norman and he's fantastic. He's, I think he's German, but I'm not sure if he lives in 
the Netherlands, or I, I'm not, it's definitely somewhere in Europe. I think he's German. But he does loads and loads of videos on like techniques. He did a finishing um, video recently and I was watching it and he, he didn't reference the, the Stephen West one particularly. Did he actually reference it as Stephen West? I can't remember. He might have, he might not have. But he was kind of saying the same thing that he, I think he'd actually done it on a little sample and he showed you the fabric and you can actually sort of see the, the, the yarn, the one that you're weaving in, you can kind of see it through the fabric as well. Um, so he wasn't mad keen on that method and he actually wove them in himself by hand using a different method to how I've always done it. It was really interesting actually what he did. Everyone's different, aren't they, in terms of what the things that they like to do, things that they don't like to do. And for me, the finishing of something, it's, it's worth the kind of effort that you go to to finish it. And because you're finishing it, I never mind doing whatever you need to do to finish an item because it's that final step, isn't it? And I'm just really excited to see the finished thing. So I never mind weaving in ends. I would rather spend the time weaving them in in the way that I do. And again, I have done a video on how, how I weave in ends on things like this. I would rather do it that way and know that the ends are secure and I'm not gonna have any problems with them when they've been in the wash and all things like that than using a quicker method. But you know, it's brilliant that there's all these options out there, isn't there, to suit everybody. So yeah, I am gonna get this one all finished. I used, for these ones, I used Chow Goo double points. And these are lovely, you know, as metal needles go, double points, I would say that Chow Goo's are my favorite. They are, they're lovely and smooth, but they're not flying off your needles slick. They're, they're slightly brushed and I really like that. So they have got a little bit of, of grip, which for me is perfect. They've got lovely points, but they're not, like stiletto points they're just they're just lovely really really lovely and these are I would say these are my favorite metal needles I also like the Adi Calibri you know those colored ones I really like those the only thing with those is I wish that both ends of the needle were the same so with the Calibri you have one end of the needle which is pointier than the other I'm not sure why they did, they did that I, I, I wish it wasn't like that because I prefer on those needles, I prefer the end that's a little bit pointier. And I think generally speaking, for knitting things like socks, most people would say they don't want a particularly blunt needle. And the pointy end isn't, it's not like it's high, higher pointy, high, high, sharp. It's not like that. It's just a really lovely tapered point. So I would prefer those if both ends were the same. And that's the only thing really that makes me not use them all the time because it's a bit, a tiny bit of a faff making sure you get the right end that you prefer when you're knitting. But yeah, I love the chow goos, no complaints at all about those. So I will have these finished for next time and I can't wait to get them finished. I think actually I'm gonna put them away and give them to Bryony for Christmas because they're a nice long leg and she really likes this pattern, the fairground pattern, her favourite one that I've made are the watermelon ones. She wears those and wears those. And they've been in the wash loads and they've washed brilliantly well. So Dan Jones, what's on your needles? Hearing you talk there reminded me of my grandma. Oh, that's nice. And I remember once I was doing something with her, I was around at her house helping her do something. And I remember saying, oh, I know an easy way. And I remember her taking my hand like this and she said, Daniel, there's no such thing as an easy way. <laughs> there's the right way and there's the wrong way. <laughs> an easy way is simply an excuse for cutting corners. And I've Gosh, remembered that my whole that's life. That's very, very harsh, isn't it? Well, I don't know if it is harsh. Because <sighs> yeah. if you're using the phrase, there's an easy way, that means that you're avoiding doing something. Yes, that I mean, that is true, isn't it? Yes. If there's an easy way of doing something, there's obviously an alternative yes. way that's a little bit not easy. I loved it. I, loved it. I can still feel a hand on mine, Daniel. Oh. There's no such thing as an easy way. There's the right way and the wrong way. 
<laughs> We're going to yeah. do it the right way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I would agree with her in a lot of things, I think. Yeah, I am, I am quite like that, really. Yeah, I mean, I think it, well... It does. It all comes down to your personality at the end. It of the does. Day. It does. Yeah, it absolutely does. And it comes down to how much time you want to spend on something and whether it, things bother you. You know, you not. You might not mind these things. You you might not, but you should always strive to be the best that you can be. Surely. Well, yeah, I I but agree. Again, that's a but mindset, to, isn't it? It is. So to you, that that level could well be different to someone else's best level and I mean, there's nothing wrong with that it's funny because a totally separate incident my dad my grand's son i remember my dad saying to me i don't mind what you do just so long as you strive to be the best at it that you can possibly be yeah you know and we say that to Bryony. and i just think that that was the most positive brilliant advice mm-hmm. anyone's ever given me because it was like you know make of your life whatever you want to make of it yeah but just aspire to be the best. Yes. And he actually followed that up by saying, if you do that, you will always be content and happy. And That's I would true. say that he was correct. I, I agree, I agree. You know, if you're yeah. doing the absolute best you can in all aspects of your life, then what more can you do? That's Well, you can't. No, and, no. and no, nobody w- should expect anything other than your best. And your best is not necessarily the same as someone else's best. But I think what I... Should, you know... It, what, what I loved the most about what he said was that happiness is such a hard thing to find, isn't mm, it, sometimes? Mm, mm. And actually, perhaps it just comes out of us doing our best. Mm, if you mm. do your best, you know personally there's nothing more that no, I can no. give. Yeah. And perhaps does happiness come from contentment as well? Yeah, yeah, I'd say so. So at the end of a hard day, I've done everything I same, can today. It's the same kind of feeling, isn't it? Yeah, if you're content, that's probably going to lead mm, to feelings mm, of happiness, mm, I would guess. I mm. don't know. Anyway... Yeah. Look, what am I knitting? Very deep conversations today is most excellent. <laughs> this is the Aaron Harper Gansey. It's not oh, a Gansey. It's not a Gansey. But it's called the Aaron Harper Gansey. <laughs> I'm really sorry. I didn't name the... the... We didn't, no, we didn't name it. <laughs> but look, this is now 4K, which is lovely. Yay! And I've been on a real journey with this yarn because when I started out down here, I didn't like it because it just mm. doesn't stretch. Woo-gee. So that made it extremely difficult to work with. As I then knitted into it, because it's Shetland, mm. it really does suit the colour work really well. So I started to sort of enjoy it then. But actually, amazingly, plain knitting, seeing the quality of the fabric, that's what has made me think, oh, this is good. And also as well, ah. Oh. Yeah. Smell the sheep. It does smell nice. Bryony hates it. We said, oh, Bryony, smell this when... When you were knitting it the other day, she's like, "It's very oh. sheepy." I really <laughs> That's like that. Funny. It's I like funny it. because you would you would think that the lopi would smell more sheepy than it, this. It doesn't. I don't think. No. Do you think? No. I'd, it let lopi doesn't smell like this. It doesn't. It's funny, isn't it? I mean, yeah. let lopi the whole. It's, it's lovely. Mm, you know? Well, you know how everything, much <laughs> it's loved in this house. Everything about it is lovely, but this, you know, I, I think adding that sort of smell. Mm. It gives it an extra, I don't know. Dimension. Yeah, definitely. So it's the Jameson and Smith Aran weight. And the colour, the, the sort of main colour that Dan's working with is light grey. These are all the colours and my goodness, they are just gorgeous. They look so nice. And, you know, the, the, the blue and the white, I mean, Kay picked them all. I'm rubbish at picking colours. Yeah, colours. I think the blue is muscle blue, as in muscle, as in like the shellfish. There's bits on a mussel. That are dark blue. There yes, is. Yes, on the, yes the, the outside of the shell is is dark, isn't it? Yes. And then the white is just their sort of white. I don't know what it's called, Got natural say, or whatever. I've not had mussels in a long time, but I used to love a bucket. I've never, never eaten a mussel, never bucket. want to eat a mussel, thanks very much. I used to love it. I used to get them all the time. I know, you, you, you love mussels, don't you? Yeah. You, you like a lot of seafood. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yes. Look at the twist on that. I mean, yeah, that, that's it is so like, loose. It, it is. I mean, it's very loosely plied. And that, I it's mean, very rope like, isn't it? You know, it really it suits the kind of feeling of yeah, the Yeah, because the, the dude was, was stood in front of a boat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It what has... is it with me and jumper patterns with guys and boats? Boats, I know. Because the Radari was the same, wasn't it? We should, when we finish this right. This is what we should do. When you finish this, we yeah, should go somewhere. I know, but you've got jumpers. I you, do. You've done the Ridari, yeah. which so is the man with the rope. We should both buy We need buy to rats. recreate this photo, don't we? When I've got this one, 
and you put your Idari on. We need to go to like a harbour, which is easy because there's some quite close by. No, no, we, and we, say we'll to some fishermen, can we borrow these ropes? Well, no, 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 no. Swing no, them no. over. We buy the ropes. We're not going to buy the yes, ropes. Yes, yes. What we do is... What we, are we going to do with the ropes We afterwards? both buy the ropes. We don't buy right? the... We then go to the harbour. Right. And we then walk around and see if people think that we're locals. <laughs> but yes, it's the Aaron Harper Gansey. Really enjoying it. It's just plain knitting, which is weird for me because I don't normally enjoy that. I'd but... say you're nearly at the underarms for me. I don't want this long. No, I know. I don't want it long at all because I'd be wearing it with jeans, so I don't want it long. I mean, look, we're not really not far off at all. I mean, the, the, I need to measure a jumper that is the right length for me. Well, th- that that one, the top you've got on, is that much longer. Right, but this is a, a little bit of a longer top. I don't when I wear jeans, I don't like the jumper these days really to be that much below my belt line because I just think it makes me look more bulky around yeah. the middle. What else is on your needles? Oh, I've got something very exciting. Now, Dan said that wrong. What else is on your sewing machine? No, no. What, what well, else it's, is... it's needle, not needles. Okay, okay, sorry. It's a different sort of needle because I've got some cross stitch to show you. Oh, sorry. So I've been cross stitching quite a bit the past sort of few weeks. It's all because of the beach days. It is really. You know, I did the beach days cross stitch design, which. A lot of people now have sewn their way through, stitched their way through, and we're just coming into starting the bag making tutorial now, aren't we? Yeah, this is of course all part of our great summer of stitching yeah. 2023. Yeah. And uh, you did the beginner guide to cross stitch too, where you also yeah. did that lollipop design. I did, and which some is really people cool. have used that to make bags. So yeah, I've been doing quite a lot of cross stitch, and I've sort of been looking into the whole cross stitch world just a teeny bit and I've, I've sort of found a few favorites with in terms of like kits and designs and things so I've bought a few and I've stitched I've stitched one completely I'm going to show you I've started stitching another and I've got a couple more lined up so I thought it might just be fun to to sort of let you know what I'm up to so the way that my start this stitching started after I'd done the beach days I was just really like Oh, I'm really enjoying cross stitch and I'd like to do something else. And I wanted to do something Christmassy because, again, we were getting into the summer and I tend to like to do things that take me away from the heat, which in this case, you know, as we've said, hasn't been the case this year. But anyway, I thought, oh, I'd like to do something Christmassy, something festive. So I went looking around and I really like a company, a UK company called Caterpillar Cross Stitch. I'm sure a lot of you will know it if you're, you are in the sort of cross stitch vibe. And they are a UK company and they do kits. You can buy the charts separately. They do needle minders. They do all, all you know, all of the gubbins basically to do with cross stitch. And their designs are lovely. They're quite sort of, not quirky, but the thing I like about them the most is that a lot of them, there's no outlining. It's just pure cross stitch. And I really like that look of not having outlining on a piece. Because going back sort of 20 years when I used to cross stitch a lot, it was always that was outlining was like really a big thing. And you know, you did all your cross stitch and I'm looking up at a little Pooh Bear one up there that I did years ago. That's all outlined. It was a really important element of it because it sort of brings it all to life. But there's something about the look of a piece when it doesn't have outlining, I think. It just has a softer sort of look and it's really a little bit cartoony, kind of. So I found the one that I chose from Caterpillar Cross Stitch is the Lucky Nutcracker. And I just bought the chart, which I think was, I think it's about £5.50, which I think is brilliant. And then you just print it all at home. And the benefit of that is if you've got lots of threads, then it might be that you've got a lot of the colours that you need. So it's, it's much more cost effective. So I just bought the chart, printed it. I did have some threads and then I just bought some of the others. And 
I, I can't really show you the charts because obviously it's a paid for, but you will have seen the, the image. And I didn't, I bought this because I didn't want to stitch the whole thing. The whole thing was a bit big. What I wanted to do was, was take out little elements of it, stitch them separately with the intention of them making them into project bags because I loved the whole Beach Days process so much, making it into a project bag. I wanted to do that again and make a Christmas bag. So that's what I did. I wanted to take out the Nutcracker image and then what I did was I dotted a few of the little motifs that are around that larger piece around the Nutcracker. I stitched it and I've made it into a bag. I'm so pleased with this. I think it's one of the most favourite bags I think I've ever made in my life. I just love it and here it is, look. How lovely is that? And I used a, a Zweigert fabric. It's 14 count Ada, but it's got a sparkle in it. I don't know whether the sparkle's coming across. And it was such a joy to stitch, honestly, really, really. I loved it, I absolutely loved it. It's got enough interest, so it's got enough interest, but you're not changing colors every two seconds. And I really like that. So, you know, you get a nice little chunk on his legs and his arms and his body and then his crown. And, you know, I really like that. So, you're not, it's not too fussy to stitch. It just was such a lovely thing to stitch. So, yeah, I stitched the piece. And then with the intention of making this into a bag, I went looking for some fabrics. And this range that I've used is Liberty Quilting Cotton. And I think this range was new this year. It's called Deck the Halls. And on the front here, we've got little red, a red print with houses and trees. We've got some trees down the side. On the bottom, it's like a, it's all toys. And there is actually one that looks a bit like a nutcracker in there. And then the back is like strings of fairy lights. And inside, I need to be careful because I've got a project in here that's secret. But inside I've used this one, which is like a starburst kind of. I do like a paler coloured lining to a bag because then it's easy to see what's in there. But yeah, in here I've got my advent design for this year so yeah I made this bag and I also had can you see the little um, what is actually I think a progress keeper this is from Fripp and Brip oh I can never say the name of the shop Fripp and Bib it's short for Fripperies and Bibbalots in the UK and I had this I bought this fairly recently this might have actually been I might have bought this, I think, in May when it was the King's coronation, but it just reminded me of a nutcracker. So I've added that on. So lovely. And isn't it just so gorgeous? And if you want to make a bag like this, yeah. Kay's teaching you exactly how, because you used exactly the same techniques. I did. I used exactly the, the same. Days. Exactly the same techniques. And that series yeah. has just begun and it's running all through August. Yeah. I think it finishes yeah. on the 22nd of August. It's five parts long. And yeah. it takes you through very detailed absolutely everything yes um so yeah i wanted to make it quite a large bag and this is it has come out quite a nice size oh i just absolutely love it i keep looking at it i just put it on my desk and keep glancing across at it every now and again because i just love it so much so i finished that entirely but i will go back to this chart and use more of the motifs because there's like the sugar plum fairy and there's what else was on there? There was like a really nice, the grandfather clock, big Christmas tree in the middle. So I will definitely go back and use more of the motifs from it. So that then made me want to sort of do some more stitching. And I was watching Ali, Little Drops of Wonderful, recently, and she'd just finished a cross stitch. And I really loved it. So I'm going to go and look at that company again. This is a, a UK company called The World in Stitches. And I bought a couple of kits from her and I've started one and I'll show you that in a minute. This is the one that Ali was, uh, or has finished. They're only little, but the company's The World in Stitches and it's like an advent mandala. But I just love the colours, they're very me. And look at all the colours. 
They're so pretty. So I got this one and I got another, and it's the other that I've started. Do you know one thing I've got to make is some cross stitch, no, it's not in that bag, is some cross stitch bags because I don't really have any cross stitch bags. So the one I've started is from the World of Stitches again. And look, it's this cute little Halloween ghost. How adorable is that? It's only small and I, I really like doing these sort of smaller pieces. You know where you can just put it in a hoop and that's the size it is without move having to move the hoop around or anything. I just really like that. This company, you know, it's new to me. I've never used, never bought anything from her before. I think the lady's called Colleen. Let me tell you, this is brilliant. It's really brilliant. You know, I can't show you, show you the chart, obviously, but it's a full colour chart that almost fits A4. It's on, oh, that's the back of it. The, it. This is like, I can show you this. It's on a quite a heavy paper, more like a light card. It's really good. There's a full stitching guide inside it on how to cross stitch and how to back stitch. Brilliant if you've never done it before. I think it was £10 for the kit. And you've got all the threads as well, which all come sorted. Brilliant. You've got a needle, fabric. So the only thing that I didn't get was a hoop. I think you can get a hoop if you haven't got one as well within the kit, but I already had one. And I've started stitching this one. That's the ghost. That's the ghost, yeah. Isn't it sweet? I've not done a lot, but I've just started up at the top here with these gorgeous colours and I've done a couple of stars. And then the ghost itself fits in the middle here. And this one is really fun to stitch. The only thing I'm not mad on is the, the fabric that comes with it is lovely. It's a sparkle fabric again, but it's I'm pretty sure it's not Zweigert. I think it might be a DMC. There's nothing wrong with DMC Ada at all, but the Zweigert that I've used you know, on mine, it's just slightly softer. This one is quite stiff. There's nothing wrong with that, but personal preference I prefer the Zweigert and I could have I've got pieces I could have substituted it but I thought that's silly I might as well use what's there and I've got a little needle minder here which is also from Caterpillar Cross Stitch I need a uh, Halloween themed one this is a little teacup and I'm, I'm really just enjoying it I'm loving it this one does have some back stitch as you can see in the ghost in the middle that is back stitch and I initially thought that the ghost wasn't stitched I thought that's just the white fabric but it's not the ghost is stitched and it's in this most beautiful color it's like a really really pale sea glass really lovely and these are all DMC threads so really high quality kit and she's, she's got lots of designs and I will definitely be going back and buying more from her because it's just really quick service as well. Excellent quality and really fun to stitch. So I'm just, I'm just loving my stitching. I do have a couple of other charts that I've bought recently but I will show you those another time. So what else is on your Ooh, needles? Do that's, I not normally say that? You don't but that's fine. Yeah. It clearly is a special occasion. <laughs> I cast on the feeder book, the feeder brook farm yarns. Oh, that's difficult tricky. to say, isn't My it? My goodness, this is the it's the hand spun, but it's not hand spun. I'm sure it's machine think, done. Is it? Yeah. Right. But it doesn't matter because it still looks like hand spun. Yeah. It, it does. It's just exceptional. I mean, it's exactly what you would expect. I was like, what, what am I going to knit with this? And we were looking around all sorts of different things and none of it really cut the mustard at all. Mm. First of all, there was not a lot of hat patterns in this weight. That's yeah. right, isn't it? Yeah, I just yeah. struggled to find a DK weight well, hat I, pattern. That... I originally looked and everything that I looked at and said, oh, would this work? I went, no, that's for... Worsted. There yes. was a lot for worsted. And this yarn is very definitely DK. I... It, it, it wouldn't substitute as a worsted. And I know you can tweak the size and things like that, but I just wanted something, oh, you know, let's just make that. <laughs> so I said to Kay, I've got this idea for a hat where I use two of the colours. 
Yes. And, and halfway through the hat, there's this thing where it changes from one colour to the next. Yeah. And I sort of described it to her. And I was like, I'll, I'll try charting it out. And then she went away and did it anyway. So I got, <laughs> I got, I got the chart that I needed and I that was great. I knew you'd never get around to doing it. Oh, I would have tried. I, I definitely would have tried. I probably would have failed. Yeah, but, you know, trying, you know, is, is always... Fun. I guess, yeah. Yep. Go and so go. Yeah, cast it on and knitted through. I'm starting off with this more sort of bluey one. It's blue into Lovely. greens, which is really cool. Oh, look at that. So it started off and it was green and then it's sort of transitioned now into blue, which is really cool. It's like a bluey purple now, isn't and it? So that's where I'm up to. And oh, how much more do you think I should do before I start the changeover? I don't know. It's up to you. Isn't it beautiful? It's up to you, really. About another inch or two, maybe. Yeah. Yes, yes. Yeah. Cool. So Dan wanted like a sort of wave across the hat as the demarcation we'll point. We'll be waving into this. Yeah. And then he's going to change yarns and do like a colour work wave and change to this one. And I think it'll be amazing. Yeah. Because I think this will really pop. It will pop. We, we chose, because you've got four skeins of this and we chose two of them which we thought would... Yeah. Contrast really well. Yeah. It's gorgeous yarn. It's lovely and soft. It's slightly got that silky feel because it's BFL. It's lovely to work with. It's really springy, yeah. which is really nice. It's very sort of tactile, which is exactly what you would expect from a hand spun, even though it's not. And, you know, I couldn't I couldn't really be any happier with it. I mean, it's perfect. Really lovely. It's perfect. I highly recommend mm -hmm. Feeder Book. I can't say it. Cedarbrook Farms. It's too much. The lady's name is Lisa. Yes. And the, I'm knitting this on DPNs, just like I knitted the windswept windsheaf. That hat, yeah. I can't help but call it the windswept. Uh, anyway, so I'm knitting these on DPNs. And when I knitted the windsheaf on DPNs, I was getting really bad ladders. This time, the ladders are way better. Mm. It's probably still 25% away from where I would expect them to be. It is just the ribbing which is the challenge. Yeah, for, with regards to the ladders. Yes, because mm. in the body it's absolutely perfect. And I love knitting hats on DPNs. Yeah, I mean, you might be wondering why Dan is knitting a hat on double points because, you know, I, I knit hats on a short circular and then just finish it off on double points. But he wanted to and... That, that would be he, like asking, why do you drive an automatic Instead of a yes. manual. Yes. Yeah, it's just a personal preference. And you, th there was a few reasons why you wanted to. One is because you wanted to practice on your double points and technique. I want to get really good. You want to get really end. good on sort of longer double points. Yes. And then you also like not having to change needles for the decreases. Yes. It's simple, isn't it? You just use those needles all the way through the project. This is also more interesting. Yeah, and you find it more interesting because you like working points. over a needle, working over a needle, working yeah, over a needle. Yeah. Whereas otherwise, it's just around and around. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. I so much prefer it. Personal preference, really. But yeah. the, you might be wanting to know what colourways these are. I, I'd struggle to tell you because it hasn't been written very well yes, on the why back. I didn't try. One of, no, I'd have to look on my order. One of them is gravity. Can you remember that which? One. I think this one. Yeah, this one. I think is gravity. But the other one. Oh, she's only like written part of the name of it, and I can't remember the rest of it. But that was the other one. <laughs> So make of that what you will. But the yarn's just lovely. It is. And it's a great project and I'm doing and good. You'll have loads. So because you're doing oh, I'll it... Do, I'll do more. You, you'll be able um, to make... Prop, with those two skeins you've got there, you could, I think you could easily make three hats. So Yes, and what I figured was by using two in this way, th th if I was then... Because normally when I've knit with a yarn, I, do get, I don't want to knit with the same colourway again. Mm. But when you... It changes though. It does change. It's, but when you're doing it like this... I will want to knit with it mm. because I've done it, you know, with these two colours and next mm. time I might do it with something different mm. and, mm. you know, slightly different. And so it's just made it so that the, the skeins will, or the cakes, will yeah, remain and in it's usage. It's cool, you know, and then whatever you've got left over as well, you might want to use all of them in a cowl using the same technique. Absolutely. You know, and that would be really lovely, wouldn't what it? What else is on your needles? So the last thing I've got to show you is another pair of socks and... This is another pair that are almost finished. Oh, <laughs> I was like, oh, I'm definitely going to get these ones finished. But no, not quite. But they will be imminently because these socks have been on the needles since 
Well, let me tell you, because I've got it written down in my little Dan Sock journal. I cast these on on the 20th of April. Come on, people, it's August now and I've not finished them. It's just not on, but I will have finished them very soon. So it's these ones, do you remember, for Dan? So it's the socks using the Malabrigo Ultimate Sock. Oh, they are lovely, aren't they? And this is Indesita, is the colourway. And it does do a flash, it's not a flashy thing actually, it's more like a spiral of colour. I actually don't mind that because it does look sort of like a striping yarn, doesn't it? I really don't mind it too much when yarn does this. It's the flashing and the pooling, you know I can't stand, I don't need to go on about that again. And I haven't woven in my ends yet, there's only two because I just used the same yarn all the way down. So I will do that when I finish the other one. And I put in a stitch pattern which, what did I call this stitch pattern? Because I wrote an article about it in the last Knitability and I put in the chart in case anyone else wanted to use it because it just looks so lovely. It was something to do with, was it sea salt or something like that? Because it looks like a mermaid scales, I think. Can you see the stitch pattern? It's really, really lovely. It's just knits and pearls. But I put this chart in the last knitability. And look at the second sock. I'm nearly done. <laughs> I'm right at the end of the foot again. So here's the second one all the way down. And I'm literally right at the end of the foot. I think I might have one more repeat or something. And then I'm at the toe. And it's really cool because I will have used nearly all the yarn. I've just got this left. I might have, I think when I weighed the first sock, I worked out I might have about seven or eight grams left of the yarn, which is lovely. It's enough to do something with in a scrap project, but it's not so much that you feel like you're not using the skein fully. So that's really good to know. I really like this yarn. So if it wears well for Dan, then I'll definitely use it again for him because it's just so nice to knit. So yeah, it's the Malabrigo Ultimate Sock. So it's got nylon in it, whereas Malabrigo Sock doesn't, it's just 100% Merino. Malabrigo Ultimate Sock is 25% nylon, so perfect. And I'm doing this, these magic loop, and this might be another reason why I haven't gravitated towards knitting these, because I am more into double points right now. But I've nearly finished it now, so I'm gonna persevere. I don't like switching between magic loop and double points like halfway through a project because my gauge is slightly different. I think I'm a bit tighter on double points than I am on magic loop. This is two and a half millimeter and this one is an Addy sock rocket. I think they're called in other countries. They're not called sock rockets here, but it's the same needle, I think. I really like it. It's a really nice needle for magic loop. So almost finished those. Again, I will show you these finished and blocked and everything next time but look at the yarn isn't it lovely the colors are gorgeous i think really really pretty right ladies and gentlemen it's time for my favorite blanket Yay. and as we said at the start of the show it's particularly exciting today's episode because yes after four episodes of fancy business mm -hmm. it's time to begin the decreases yes but fear not because there's still lots of episodes and lots of time to enjoy some really wonderful seasonal colors so what is it that's the inspiration for today's colorway let's find out as we watch a brand new episode of my favorite blanket I adore creating and knitting blankets, so I decided to design a new one just for us. In this series, I'm going to show you how to make your own. From the yarn, to the stitches. Join me as we knit through the seasons to create my favorite blanket.
Welcome everybody to another episode of My Favourite Blanket. And yes, we are back in the woods and it's actually just started to rain. <laughs> Which I'm not complaining about, it's very nice. But I'm here today to tell you about the next flower that we are going to dye up our yarn inspired by. So we're now into section nine. So this flower is representative of September. I know we're not quite in September yet, but we're getting there, aren't we? So we're sort of heading into those more autumnal shades. So the flower that I've chosen, I'm really excited about, it's a dahlia. Now I could have chosen a dahlia over the past couple of months because they do flower for quite a long time, but I've saved it for this month because it's this particular one that I wanted to use. And the variety is called the Bishop of Auckland. It's absolutely gorgeous. It's a single dahlia. I think it's called a single flower dahlia because there's a few varieties. There's those ones that look like big balls and they've got sort of petals all over. There's then a more kind of, I don't know what they're called, the variety, but it looks like there's a lot more layers of petals. And then there's the single variety, which look more like a daisy. And this one is the single flower variety. It's a deep, velvety crimson colour to the petals, absolutely gorgeous. And the stems are, are almost black, really, really unusual. So those are the colours we're going to go with sort of deep reds and we're going to use black as well. And we're also going to use a hint of purple. So really, really exciting. I can't wait to get this one dyed up. So before we do that, of course, we need to get out of this pouring rain that is now coming down and get into the kitchen and dye up our yarn. inspired yarn. So we're going to need yarn. As always I've got my yarn here soaking away in just some warm tap water with a scoop, tablespoon or so of citric acid and I've got my usual four skeins of 50 grams of fingering weight yarn in here soaking away. Each of my 50 grams is 200 meters and I'll be dyeing up two of these, as usual, in each of the colourways. So we've got a speckled and we've got a tonal, slightly variegated actually today for, for the complementary colour. So that's soaking away nicely in there. We've got our dyeing pots, my usual dyeing pots, which are these stainless steel casserole pots that I like to use. I'll say it once more because it might be that this is the first time you're watching me dye yarn, but all of your equipment that you use to dye yarn, you must only use to dye yarn. Do not use for any other purpose because dye powders are toxic, so you don't want to use them for anything other than dyeing your yarn. I've got my big mixing spoon. You know I can't work without my big mixing spoon. A mask, of course. I've got my two pairs of gloves, a heavy weight and my thin ones. I've got something to protect my work surfaces because I'm here in the kitchen and we don't want to get those dye powders anywhere other than in the pot. So I've got a piece of spare oil cloth. I find this brilliant actually. You know, go to your local haberdashery shop and just buy yourself like half a meter or something. But I also just have a few old tea towels as well, just for, you know, because things do get slightly wet, you know, your brushes, your big mixing spoon, and I just like to keep those off the work surface. We've got our citric acid, which I've already mentioned. I just buy this from Amazon. This size of a tub costs me, I think it's £10 from Amazon, and it lasts absolutely ages. And this is the little scoop that come, I think this scoop came with it. Do you know, I don't know that it did now I say that. I wonder if this, oh, 
that went on the table. I wonder if I got this in something else because when I buy new ones of these now, there isn't a scoop in it, but I wonder if I did get one at one point that had a scoop in. I don't know where I got this scoop from, but I think it's about a tablespoon. We've got our brushes for speckling and our measuring spoon, which is one eighth of a teaspoon. My die book with my recipe in and then the dies, finally the dies. So we're going to use four colours today. Three of them are landscape, one of them is jacquard. So I will, as always, I'll describe the colour to you as best I can, and then if you want to substitute in a different dye brand. I tend to use landscape the most, I would say. Jacquard probably second and Dharma dyes probably third. I do have a number of Dharma dyes. They're quite difficult to get hold of. It's, I think it's an American brand and I did used to get them from America. A friend used to help me get them. But now I think there is an Etsy shop, um, or there might be a few shops now that if you just Google it, that you can actually get them from the UK. But overall, I do prefer the landscape dyes. I think the colours are beautiful. It's really easy to use. It's great for speckling. It is more expensive. That's the only thing I will say. But for me personally, it's worth it. So what colours are we going to need? So first of all, the jacquard colour is number 613 purple. And that is as it sounds. It's just like a true purple, I would say. We're using it actually in a really delicate way and you actually get a sort of lavender colour from it. But if you were to use it in a more concentrated form, it's just like that true sort of quite deep purple colour. And then the landscape dyes. So the first one is Kurawong and this is a black. Now you can substitute another black the other one I, I use is Jet Black from Jacquard and I did historically always use Jet Black. However, I find that the Jacquard Jet Black has a kind of brownish undertone. So for example, when you're speckling with it, and I have tried this out actually, when I trialed this colour, I did try both blacks and I preferred the landscape. What the Jacquard tends to do when you speckle it, where it kind of dissipates out a little bit into the yarn, I find that it can look a bit brownish and I don't really like that. The Kura one for me is like a proper true black and it's much easier to, to handle. But if you can only get jet black from Jacquard or Dharma or whatever, then you just basically want black. The other two colours are, the first one from Landscape is Bordeaux. Now, if you think of a Bordeaux wine, that's the colour. It's that kind of deep reddish, slightly going towards brown, a little bit sort of purplish. Do you know that sort of colour, like a burgundy-ish colour? Bordeaux. And then the second and final one of the four from Landscape again is Salmon Gum. Now, this one, I think, makes you think that it's going to be that sort of salmon pink colour, but it, it really isn't. It's, it's a red. I guess it's erring towards the slightly orangey red, but for me it just looks like a nice red. But you want, if you're looking for another red, you just want a red that is not going more towards the burgundy. You want it going more towards the sort of lighter, maybe slightly orangey tone reds. Okay, so that is everything you're going to need. So I need to get some water in this pot over to the stove and we can start dyeing the yarn. Okay, so in my pot here, I've got some water heating up with another scoop of citric acid in it, but I've actually got even less water than I normally have when I speckle yarn. And the reason for that is because I'm using black, I just find that I really like to contain the black right on the yarn and not try and you know get too much water near it. So I've probably only got maybe three quarters of an inch of water in there and that's just heating up. It's nice and steamy now so I'm just going to turn it down and I'm going to get my yarn into that water. So I'm going to get two of my 50 gram skeins and pop it into the pot. So I've squidged out all that water so again we're not introducing too much water into the pot. It's had a lovely soak so it will be thoroughly soaked with the citric acid. So let's get it in. 
Now this might be quite hot, I might need my other glove on. Mm, yes. Some of you might wonder why I don't just wear thicker gloves the whole time. I'm just funny with gloves. I don't generally like wearing rubber gloves. I just find I can't feel as much because I find dyeing yarn a very tactile thing and if my fingers feel like big old sausage fingers I don't feel like I can really feel what I'm doing so that's the reason I'm fussy with my gloves so you can see actually there's hardly any water at all in there can you see how there's just the smallest amount in the bottom here so I am going to sort of smoosh it down a bit to make sure that it's thoroughly, thoroughly soaked. Essentially, you can't really see any water on the top. There we go. And the temperature's just down low now, so it's quite hot. So I'm gonna pop on my mask and we can get the first color in there. Okay, so the first color we've got going into the pot, into the yarn, is the Bordeaux. We're starting out with this one. So this one is going to give a dark kind of undertone. The flower itself, if you remember, is a really dark red, you know, really sort of deep red. And the stems of the yarn are that almost black. So that's the colors we're, we're working with leaning more towards sort of that purplish black in terms of the stems. I can see the yarn is starting to move in there which means the water underneath is boiling. So I'm just going to turn off my heat for the moment because I don't want too much movement of the yarn going on. And we're going to, as we've done before, same technique. So I'm going to grab some of that Bordeaux and speckle away. You can see it goes on really dark and when you see the colour starting to emerge it does have a sort of purplish, reddish purplish tone to it which when we top it with the salmon gum the two colours together really create a beautiful mix and it does give an impression of that flower. I'm going to go over there and just stick a little bit on the tops of those two. And because we want a nice deep speckling, you know, don't be afraid to really let a little bit drop on. You know, it's nice to get delicate speckles, but we do want to get intense delicate speckles, if that makes sense. As the moisture gets to it, the colour starts to emerge and it does, this dye is lovely actually, it does break a little bit so you do get purplish tones and you do get reddish tones too. So you can see I'm putting a few little really delicate speckles around as well. Can you see how beautiful those tiny, tiny specks are? Just lovely. So I'm going to go with this this time. So that's that deep purplish reddish on. So now we're going to go to the salmon gum and same thing. I'm going to go over the areas I've already speckled but then let it sort of go over the edges so we get little areas that just have their own colour. Can you see, you might not be able to, but to me I can see a huge difference between the two dye colours. This is much more red but one on top of the other really gives you a nice depth of colour. And because these landscape dyes are really granular, you can kind of scoop it up onto your brush. That looks good to me. So I'm now going to take my Kuro on and at the same time I'm just going to pop my heat back on actually. And just speckle little areas of black in between. Just find any sort of white areas. Just put on a little bit of that black. That's fine I think actually. So you see we've got these little areas of black. Okay, so I'm going to now just let the temperature come back up and I can see movement in that yarn. I don't know if you can see it, but the yarn's kind of moving. So I know that there's a good amount of heat coming up under there. And once that's got nice and hot, I'm gonna, I will cover it just with a piece of foil, if you've got a lid, pop a lid on. And that'll contain the heat and keep the heat on the surface as well. And just let that set for probably, I will give this a good 10 minutes. Because these colours are so intense, I really want to make sure they're set before we move that yarn around. Because I do want to 
create sort of lighter areas can you see how we've still got all these lighter areas and I think it just looks so beautiful to have the contrast between the deep flower colour here and then the bare yarn inevitably this bare yarn section it will get a gentle overall colour from the other dyes I don't think that's really avoidable completely you know um, so that's now a really nice temperature so I'm going to cover that over I might turn the heat off if I think it's getting too hot and I'm just going to give that 10 minutes to set okay so that's had a good 10 minutes now what I do to sort of check the set is just find a little area like this and just gently press it down go cautiously in case it is not quite set but you can see as I push that down into the water there's no movement on those black speckles now the pink the sorry the red red is notorious for well I think it's notorious for not setting sort of like a hundred percent it can bleed when you use reds and so I'm expecting the red to you know there to be some red dye still in the water the white yarn will likely end up like a pale pink you can see there's a bit here but the sort of speckles around the outside look good can you see the tiny speckles all look good it's this intense area in the middle where it's likely that some of that red dye is still going to be remaining but that's absolutely fine less waffle let's just move the yarn so I'm going to pick it up and just show you the sort of difference between the front and the back so as I pick it up actually can you see this is the bit that's been underneath and whilst there is a little bit of dye coming through largely you can see we've got this whole area that doesn't have very much dye so you can see how easily it would be to produce a yarn if you didn't do anything about this how easily it would be to produce a yarn where you're going to get all the speckles on one half of your skein and then not a lot on the other half so we need to address this so I will move it a little bit and the reason I do this is just to add a bit of randomness, a bit of extra randomness if you like. And then I'm going to turn and drop it back into that water and then just rearrange it back in with as much white on the top surface as I can possibly get so that we've got something to go at. As so you can see that's quite got quite a lot of dye on that end bit. So just move it down, exposing all of that white. The reds have sort of bleeded a little bit, but I just think it looks beautiful. Now I'm going to pop the heat back on and we're gonna repeat the process, probably not using quite as much. And that again will give us lots of variation within the yarn. We'll have like more saturated areas and more delicate areas. So let's start with the Bordeaux again and just go into these white areas. I'm not going to do as much this time. Over onto this side. A bit more there maybe. That, it looks good to me. Oh, actually, I'm just going to put a bit more up there. Look, can you see? Okay, so that's the Bordeaux done with. Salmon gum. And you can see I've not I've not gone as heavy this time. Just so that we get lots of variation. There. there we go. And then finally a little bit more of the Kurawang, the black. So just in between little bits of black. Over there. So that's the speckled yarn finished. So I'm just going to turn it back on actually. I'm going to do the same thing again. I'm going to give that a good 10 minutes on the heat. Check it doesn't boil too rapidly. Make sure we've got a nice set. Check it again like I did before to make sure we've got a good set. And then I will leave the cover on, but just pop it outside to cool after it's had sort of 10 minutes cooking, if you like, time here on the stove. Oh, 
Okay, so we're ready now to dye up our coordinating complementary skein. What we're going to do for this one, because we are now starting with the decreases and the stitch count is going to be changing constantly, we can be a little bit braver in terms of producing something that's slightly variegated. We don't have to worry quite so much about getting pooling. And also, this particular colourway we're going to create, it's really quite a delicate colourway. So I find that even if you do have some variegation, if your colourway is a delicate one, it doesn't really show up too much. So the first thing we're going to do is put in a little bit of the Kurawong into the pot. Now, go easy with this because we do want silver. We want a pale silvery colour. We do not want a dark grey. So start off really delicate. You can always add more, you know, if it's not what you want. And if it's too delicate, we can add some more. So I'm literally gonna put in just the tiniest bit. Can you see that? And then get your big spoon. Give it a stir. Can you see how that just produces a really gentle gray, silvery gray in there? And if we look at it like that and drop it down, you can really barely see any color in it. But we can see we have got some color in the pot. And that looks about right to me. And the, my water is heating up underneath. It's not at its hottest yet, but it's perfectly fine to get started. So I'm now going to bring in my yarn. There we go. Squidge. So I'm just going to drop it in quite slowly because I want to get a gradient of, of the sort of silvery grey. So let's just have a look. Can you see there's barely any colour, but the, that will grow if you like the color intensity will get more as we wish it around like that so you can see i'm just dropping in it, it i'm just dropping it in gently and swirling it around with my spoon and by the time we get to the top there's really no dye in there at all and by the time we've done that and swirled it around a bit your dye will have dissipated, it will have gone because there was so little in there anyway. But I like to just sort of move it around a little bit like this. And then let's have a little look at the colour. Whoops, dropped it. So you can see it is very delicate down here. Nothing at all up here. That is about the intensity of grey I want, but I do want a bit more of the skein to have a bit of the grey so I'm going to move it around a little bit so that this bit will hit the water and I'm just going to put in a little bit more of that black so you can see now we're going to get these bits are going to get a bit more grey and the bits that are grey already will get a little bit more but that'll be fine cool so I'm actually going to do this just by you might want to take your yarn out and stick it back in your bowl empty it out of water obviously um, but I'm just going to lift the yarn up, drop a little bit in, mix it and put the yarn back. So I'm just going to do even less than I did last time. Just a tiny little speck. Can you see I didn't put very much at all in? There we go. Give it a good mix and then drop it back down and do just do the same thing as before. There we go. That looks better. So you can see now we've got a lovely tonal silvery grey going on there. That looks much better. So let your yarn drop in completely. And then as that's heating up now, coming up to simmering point temperature, that dye will have, it will have gone already, that dye, because there's so little. But we just want to now bring it up to temperature and then we are going to add in that purple to give a nice lavender hue to it. So I'll just give that a couple of minutes to heat up. Right, so that's had a few minutes and the dye has all gone from the pot. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna, I am gonna move it now into my bowl. So I'm just gonna squidge it out a little bit, move it over, and then what I'm going to do now is just rearrange it on the skein so that we've got the grey section at the top here and then the sort of undyed down at the bottom. Let's do that with the other one. So find the darkest silver section like that. 
and then we've got essentially fairly undyed at the bottom. So they're now ready to go back in. And now we're going to add in a tiny bit of purple. So I'm just going to start off with just the tiniest bit. And let's see what that does. Ooh. Do you know what this colourway looks like? when? Because I have knit this up already. And when the two, when I was skeining it up and when I was knitting it up, it reminded me of crushed blackberries, which is just perfect for this time of year. Well, it's not this time of year yet, but September-ish, which is what this yarn's intended to reflect. So you can see we've just got a really gentle purple shade going on there. So I'll go with that. And it might be again, we just need to add a little bit more. So I've got my two skeins, which have the silver at the top here and more of an undyed at the bottom. And we're going to do the same thing. Take them over, dump them in, swirl it around so that that undyed section gets most of the purple and then just gradually drop the rest into it. And where they meet, it, it will just produce a very sort of silvery lavender. It's really pretty. So you can see, hopefully you can see now, this section here has got the purple on and then this is just the silver. So we've got the two colors together. So I'm just gonna have a little inspect of that and see what I think. Oh, it's lovely. But maybe it just needs to be slightly more intense. So I'm just going to move it a smidge and just add a tiny speck more. So just a tiny speck, look. And then just drop that back in. Swirl it around. That's lovely. There we go, that's what I wanted. So now you can see the difference here between the, just the silver here and then this gorgeous lavender colour. And where they meet in the middle, you get a little amalgamation of it. So now that's the colour done. Turn it up, turn your temperature up. It is steaming already, but I just want to make sure that that's simmering. And then as soon as it starts to simmer, I will turn it off, take it outside to cool down with the other skeins. Okay, so that is our yarn all dyed up and cooling away outside. So come back in part two. We will bring the yarn in, we'll give it a rinse, we'll get it dry, and then we are gonna start knitting the decreases on our blanket. I'm so excited. So I will see you back soon. Bishop of Auckland, I love it. Bishop Auckland is just up the road. I know, yeah, Bishop Auckland is close to us. It's yeah. also made me fascinated about why Bishop Auckland is called Bishop Auckland. Mm. This was the land of the Prince Bishops. Yeah. Because yeah. of the presence of Durham, we covered this in episode five mm -hmm. of Rise and Fall of the Monasteries because the, the Bishop of Durham was empowered to be like a king in right. the area. And that's why it's known as the land of the Prince Bishops. Mm -hmm. Bishop Auckland makes me think that perhaps there was a Bishop of, of Durham called Bishop Auckland, maybe. Maybe so. Maybe his palace was at Bishop Auckland, I'm maybe not sure. So. Interested now. Very interested, but isn't it gorgeous? All of Dahlia's. I've that been... variegated is very bold. It's not really. I, I No, I think you were bold because you don't normally die that way. No, but I have done it a couple of times with the blanket when it would be in the increases and decreases because your stitch count's changing. Yes. So you're less likely to get kind of flashing and pooling. So we've risked it. But yes. this one isn't that bold because the colours are so delicate that you don't re you don't you really don't notice it. I'll show you because I've finished that section, of course. Amazing. And I will show you. It's such shortly. a gorgeous flower, though, as you say. I mean, oh, it's beautiful. And I I really wanted to do a dahlia. And I could have had a dahlia over the last couple of months because they do flower for quite a long time. But because there was so much choice of flower, there's lots more choice, obviously, in the summer months. You get less of a choice as we start getting into autumn. But this one came up, you know, when I was doing my research, this one came up. So I thought, right, I'm going to save that 
for September because it's still flowering in September. And it's just such a gorgeous colour, isn't it? I love dahlias and lovely jewels, so sweet violet, just posted, I just saw a photo of some dahlias in her garden this morning. And it was those pom-pom ones. I don't think I could remember the name of the ones that are like balls. And I think it's a pom-pom dahlia, isn't it? The most gorgeous pink flowers that she got. In part two, Kay will be showing you how to do, how to start the decreases, yes. which can be so exciting. But also, if you've been wondering why you knit the first four stitches in the previous oh, colour when correct. you're doing the changeover, correct. Kay will be showing you and telling you exactly why in part two. It's another reason why, because there, there's several reasons why I do it, some yes. of which I've already spoke about. But another one of the main reasons is coming up. Exciting. In part two. Right now, though, yeah. it's very exciting because it's time for Kay to ask. So, Dan Jones, what's off your needles? Kay had to do it twice because the first time I had a coughing fit. <laughs> it was such a shocking event yeah. that it caused a coughing fit. This is not normally what's said at this stage no, of the show. No, Look at this. It is the Hadrian's cowl. Oh, my goodness. Beautiful. It's finished. And we went to take photos in what we thought would be the most perfect spot. Because, of course, Hadrian's Wall is ruined. But York City walls are not. Mm. And so they were, as you can see from these wonderful shots, the perfect location to take the photos for the pattern which Kay has now released. Yes, indeed. So here is the cowl that you've just been looking at. Oh, look at that. Isn't it beautiful? It is just perfect. Um, and do you know what? It's the perfect length too when it's on. I put it on. You put it on and I I have put it on actually. I showed, we were showing our patrons on Sunday so I have put In it on. In our latest um, patron exclusive I'll mess, show. I'll mess up my fringe if I do now so I won't. But it's gorgeous on. It's just so lovely. This this yarn that Dan loves is the Regia Merino Yak. Mm. I would really recommend a yarn that's like this. In terms of what I mean by that is, although this is, you know, you could knit socks out of this yarn, and I have knit socks out of it, and it's beautiful. It's got that slight wooliness to it, so it's really good for colour work, and it's a, little, it's a bit plumper as well than your standard sock yarn. You know, although you could do this with like a 75-25, I, I wouldn't recommend that as the first choice. I would go for something more like the Regia Merino Yak, or another kind of sock yarn that's a tiny bit more on the woolly side, like a BFL maybe, something like that. But it's just gorgeous. And this is what I mean, sorry, you can you should talk, no. but this is what I mean about um, Dan's tension. It, it, colour work tension is always really evident in projects like this, when you have a stocking stitch section and then a colour work section, then a stocking stitch section. And this has been washed and blocked. Honestly, even before it was blocked, this is what the edge looked like. Didn't you measure the gauge as well? I've there? measured the gauge all over the cowl in, in the plain stocking stitch sections, this bit of colour work, this colour work, everywhere. I measured it several times all the way through and it measured the same. Amazing. I'm in awe. I really am in awe at your colour work skills. It's just beautiful. And the colours just suit what it is as well. Yeah. You can yeah. see a Roman soldier yeah, yeah. loving wearing this. Absolutely. He'd be like, yes, it's freezing. And up as in, we know... Up in Northumberland. I'm yes, yes. Putting that on. Yes, we know from the postcards which they sent home, which were found at Vindolanda, yeah. that they were regularly asking for socks. Yes. Because it was so cold. Because it was so cold, because they just weren't used to... The weather. How amazing know, the, would it be if they found... from Italy, didn't they? They found a postcard saying, please, would you knit me a Hadrian's cap? <laughs> it's a nice thought. Oh, my goodness. Um, but, yeah, this pattern is now available to purchase if you would like to, so you can get your copy. Highly, on. highly, highly recommended. I've, it's my favourite ever colour work project, and it's just lovely to wear. Should we show wear. people your flows? OK. Um, so you can purchase this on Ravelry or Love Crafts. Let's find... The side which has not got all the ends woven in it's always fun to see floats isn't it there we go what do you think it's pretty good isn't it on the back you could wear it both ways you could you could wear it both ways yeah. yes another just marvelous colorwork project I'm wearing that rain just 
thoroughly enjoyed it. Sweetheart Cow sort of kicked it off, flowed yeah. into Hadrian's Cow. What will come next? Oh, yeah, <laughs> that's the next thing, isn't it? He's finished it now, so he'll be like, oh, chomping at the bit. Maybe I should do a festive one. <gasps> oh, oh, she's excited now. I want to do that. <laughs> I want to do it. Oh, what colour? Should I do Don't push it in where there's not space. Just only when you've got the capacity and the time. I really want to do that. Yeah, well... I need the, I need to get two more balls of this yarn, don't I, in like a red and... and a, a white. A cream. <laughs> or should it be green? No, red. Red and white. Red and maybe a very pale grey, Yeah, actually, yeah. Okay, okay. Rather than white. She's off, you see. She's off. Oh, the I'm wheels are already that. turning. Snowflakes and Spe- <laughs> all sorts. Speaking of the wheels turning, I know you're all chomping at the bit to find out how to knit these decreases and also to yes. see how this wonderful yarn knits, knits up. up. So let's get back for the second part of my favourite blanket. Welcome back everybody to part two of my favourite blanket. So we dyed up our yarn in part one and we left it cooling outside. I then brought it in, I gave it a lovely rinse with some wool wash. You'll notice I've got now a jumbo bottle of lavender eucalan. It's my favourite. I've tried loads of different wool washers. I've, I've tried a few soak wool washers and some other fragrances of eucalan. There's one eucalan that I can't stand. Is it jasmine? Oh, I don't like that one. Anyway, the lavender one I love, so that's the one I'm sticking with. So yeah, I gave them a nice rinse, and you'll probably notice when I rinsed the speckled yarn, the water was a bit pink. The reason for that is, it, there's two reasons actually. One is that, as I said, I think when I was dyeing it, red is notorious for bleeding a little bit. But also, because we dyed this one with very little water, I spoke about that when I was dyeing it. It meant that some of the dye was still sort of sat on the surface of the yarn. It didn't fully absorb into the yarn. So that rinsed out when I washed it. It's nothing to worry about. If you want to be sure it's absolutely clear, then rinse it once, get rid of the water, rinse it again, and you'll find that the water is clear. So it's not a problem at all. So yeah, we rinsed it. I've got it all dry now, so we're ready to wind it and then get to the knitting. So as usual, I've got two already skeined up here. Oh, and it's so pretty. I do think, and I think I said this, didn't I, when I was dyeing it, that together it looks like, it reminds me of two things actually. It reminds me of crushed blackberries, but it also reminds me of blackcurrants and licorice sweets as well. So yeah, our yarns are looking gorgeous. So I've got my two, two cake up here. So I will get myself set up and then we'll get it all caked up. Okay, so we've got our little winding station set up and I'm gonna wind this um, I suppose you would call it a variegated first because we've definitely got two colours going on there. I would never dye yarn up using this technique that I used for the variegated to knit something like socks because inevitably it would do something a bit naughty. It would either pull or it would do some funky flashing or something. For this purpose it's brilliant. So I'm going to just pop this skein over my Swift. and get rid of all the ties. Let's see if I can guess right this time. I think that's the one holding the skein together. I'm just, the, the ties on the inside, so I'm guessing that I just need to flip this skein over just to make sure it winds nicely. There we go. I prefer the tie to be on the outside when I'm cutting it. I find that then it winds easier. I don't know if that's just my imagination. So let's get winding. I can't wait to, well, I say I can't wait to see what this looks like in a cake, but I've already seen it because I've test, I've test dyed this and test knit it as well. But here we go. That's better. Oh, 
Okay, there we go. Oh, it's lovely. It looks, in the cake, it looks like a sort of very gently variegated lavender silvery colour, which is exactly what we wanted. So that's good, isn't it? Looks just lovely. So I will now wind the speckled one and we can get to the knitting. Right, so here we go. We've got our two skeins all caked up. Oh, and this speckled, it just looks almost edible, I think. Just gorgeous. And that black, the Kura Wong, and I spoke about this, didn't I, and how much I love this black. It really does give that true black, and it, it's, it's very well behaved. You know, it, it set, it actually set better than the deep reds so it just brilliant so we've got these all caked up and ready to start the decrease section so we've now worked all the way through the center and we're now on section nine so the next four sections we will be decreasing back down which mirrors the first four sections we're effectively doing what we did in the first four sections but in opposite, so we're decreasing. So I will tell you once we get knitting, once I, I start this first row, I will tell you exactly what we're going to do to knit this section. And also, there's one thing I want to point out that is another reason why I start every row using the old yarn. You know how I knit the first four stitches using the previous colour? that the another one of the reasons I do that will become really obvious when I show you the decreases so let us start arranging ourselves now your blanket at this stage if you're at the same stage as me it's going to be big now there's no two ways about it it's a big old piece of fabric that we've created so here's oh look but isn't it gorgeous it's so lovely and I know the weather's warm, let's say, at the moment, but I'm still knitting this and it, it's not bothering me. You just have to kind of either, if you're in this country, you just have to choose the right time to knit it. So we are all set here to start now working the decreases. So you can see I've, I've still got my little marker on here showing me the right and the wrong side. I just move that up, it's just a visual reminder to tell me when I'm on the right and the wrong side. And we cut our old yarn with a tail of, I usually leave, what's that? 12 inches maybe, something like that. And I will pull out my two strands of yarn, just preparing myself. There we go. It knits up so lovely this. So there's our yarn ready. Now, as always, I'm going to work the first four stitches with the old yarn. So the way we're going to work the decreases is really simple. You know, we've done all of that fancy business with the eyelets, but from now on to the end of the blanket, it's plain sailing. All we're gonna be doing on every row we are going to knit to the last two stitches and then we're going to work that lift over decrease on every row. So I like to think of it as a two row repeat because we want to make sure we end on the, the right side of the work, but each of the rows is the same. So it's the same row twice and that's the two row repeat. So let's get started. So first four stitches with the old yarn And now drop that one and bring in the new one. Leave a little tail, loop it over and just start knitting. This is gonna look so lovely contrasted next to that lemon section, the previous one. So what I'm going to do now, because I want to just talk a little bit about the benefit of knitting those four first four stitches with the old yarn when it comes to the decreases. I'm going to work now to the end of my second row. So I'll go all the way across this row to the last two stitches, work the lift over decrease, I will turn 
knit across again to just before the last two, two stitches just so that I can show you and then I'm going to show you the lift over decrease again at the end of the second row and I will just explain why it's beneficial to knit those first four stitches with your old yarn. So I'll see you back in one second. So there we go, that was super quick wasn't it? I've knit two rows and I'm at the end of the second row here just about to work the lift over decrease on these last two stitches. So before I tell you why it's a good idea to knit these first four stitches with your old yarn, I just want to say that you work the that decrease row until you have 206 stitches. So if you've kept a note of your stitch count in the first four sections, you'll notice we're now working in the opposite direction. So we're going to decrease using that one row until we've got 206 stitches on your needle. Okay, so back to my second row here, the end of the second row. And the reason it's a good idea, you can probably tell just from looking at this what I'm going to say, but because we have added in our new yarn effectively on the fifth stitch here, it leaves these two stitches at the end here unaltered. What, that, what I mean by that is that I can do the decrease here on these two stitches and I haven't got any ends to worry about. If I changed yarn right at the end of the row here, I would have this situation right on those two stitches that I'm going to decrease. And it just makes it a bit of a faff, first of all, just to work that decrease, but also it's going to make that part of your blanket, every time you change colours, it's going to make that little row there just that little bit less neat. And doing it this way, it's just completely unaffected. Your edge of your blanket will be super neat, and especially as it turns the corner here, because this is going to become a corner, it just keeps it all super neat. Okay, so we can now work to those last two stitches and I'll just show you that lift over decrease one more time. So when I work over these yarns here, I just give them a little snug. And you obviously tighten those up even more when you weave them in. Okay. So we're to the last two stitches, we now can work the lift over decrease. So you take your right needle, keep your finger on the end of this stitch here so it doesn't fly off, and we're going to lift it over this other stitch. So I really keep my finger there, move it to the end of your needle. Hang on, let me situate myself a bit better. There we go. And just lift it over. And then that last stitch, knit it through the back loop. And do that as kind of, as, as neat and as tight as you can. Try not to stretch your stitches too much and it'll keep that edge really nice and neat for you. So that's our first decrease on this side that we've worked and that now is where it's going to turn that corner. So you can now just carry on working effectively I'll say it's a two row repeat because we need to end on on the correct side <laughs> but it's the same row so we're just going to knit to the last two stitches and do that lift over decrease until you've got 206 stitches on your needle go you now know everything you need to know to knit your way through section nine so I wonder if you're doing the same as me in in terms of like the colors I know that a lot of people are just using yarns from their stash or they are choosing flowers which are kind of local to them so we're now transitioning into the more sort of autumnal colors this one was a little hint at autumn it still looks super pretty and lovely but the colours of the dyes we've used are very much going now towards that autumnal palette, which is just super lovely. We can't wait for autumn to be fully here. So I am now going to carry on happily 
and knit through this section. I hope you really enjoy working through the decreases. What you'll probably find, because I've worked through this already, the decreases, and I found that although we're knitting about the same amount of yarn as we for the, all the previous sections, I had about eight or nine grams of each of my skeins left, so it's about the same amount. Because we're decreasing, it does feel like it goes a bit quicker, because each row is like one stitch less than the last row, which is lovely. It, feels, it just feels like it's a little bit quicker to knit. So enjoy your knitting, everybody, and I will see you next time for more My Favourite Blanket. an episode oh my goodness I love a bit of bold and beautiful and that's certainly what those colors are yeah it's funny actually because the you know the dye colors that we used were really bold colors you know black and when you were seeing deep, it go on yeah mm. black and deep red really bold colors but actually when it's knitted up because we left that sort of space in between because what what I didn't want is to produce a colour that was so boldly different to everything else that's gone on in the blanket, it wouldn't look cohesive. So I wanted to give you those bold colours, but that when it's knitted up, it transfers into something that blends in beautifully with the rest of the blanket. Let's talk then, and let's it, have a look sorry, at this wonderful it really, blanket. It really does. It's impossible to show because it's so big now, but here's the finished section look. Amazing. And isn't it lovely? It looks gorgeous. So it definitely is sort of bolder than like the more pastel -y shades down here. But it's not out of place bold, I don't think. It's just, it knits up beautifully with all those deep speckles. And that background colour just gives a sort of hue of like a, a duskiness in the background. It's really pretty. And I've got about, that's the two leftovers. And there's about seven, eight grams of each left over. And again, this was my aim with this blanket. I didn't want to knit so much of the yarn that you would be playing yarn chicken if your gauge was a bit different. I didn't want any of that. And we haven't had any of that. I've had comfortably seven or eight grams left of each of my 50 gram skeins from every section. And I, don't, I haven't had anyone message me and say that they've run out of yarn. Brilliant. So, yeah, fantastic. So that's section nine all done. So the decreases have begun, and if oh, you want like... the pattern, you can, of course, access it if you follow the link in the show notes below, and that's available completely free yeah. to bronze Baker Bear patrons and above. So basically what that means is for $2, you can get access to the pattern. But not only that, you could immediately download the latest issue of Knitability, which yeah. includes that sock recipe, yes. which yes. you showed at the end of What's On Your Needles. Yeah. Yeah. You could also watch our latest patron-only show, which we spoke about earlier on in the show. And you can also know that by paying your two pounds, uh, two pounds, two dollars, and accessing mm. all of those things, you're also helping keep us right yes. here, making shows like My Favourite Blanket, like the rise and fall of the monasteries and everything that we do, in fact. Everything that we do, So yes. just follow so. the link in the show notes below if you would like to download the pattern and help us stay on air. Absolutely. Uh, Thank you. Neil, my favourite blanket, it's back on the 8th of September and I can't wait. The yes. next decrease section is going to be marvellous. Can't wait to also see the gorgeous colourway that you've chosen. Yes, yes. because I've gone a bit... Bonkers. Uh, off piste just a bit with this next one because I just had to do this next colourway um, and I'll explain it all you know when we get to it because it's October is probably my favourite month of the year it's Bryony's favourite month of the year because it's her birthday and she loves October it's your birthday in October it's all the happy feels yes next time so yeah. 8th of september my favorite blanket is back and that's because next time the rise and fall of the monasteries returns for the penultimate episode yes it seems like two minutes ago that that adventure began 
And now is time for the calm before the storm. Yeah. And the calm before the storm is going to take place at possibly the most famous of all yes. the abbeys in all of England. Yes. It's going to be very exciting. Yes. Right now, though. You will love it. Yes. Right now, though, it's time for the Endy Bits. Endy Bits, my goodness. Our summer of stitching has reached its high point. Yes, the five-part, your five-part bag-making series, which we referenced earlier on the show, and you saw a bag made using that exact technique. That started on the 1st of August, runs through to the 22nd of August, and it's stupendous. I hope so. Yes. (laughs) We've also just published our latest patron exclusive show. We were talking the Barbie movie. Uh, We were answering lots of questions. And you also dyed up some Barbie-inspired yarn. I did. I did. So, yeah, we all went to see the Barbie movie this last week. And... Um, I was, I was, you know, we were, I was in all the pink vibes. We all wore pink. There was hardly anybody there wearing pink. It was vastly disappointing. We, Dan had, a, we all had pink on anyway. I had a pink shirt on he and did. rainbow socks. He did, he did. He looked fantastic. That I could pink not is have gorgeous. got more into the vibe. Dan really suits pink, and it was like a fuchsia pink. It was gorgeous. I had a pink pink top on. Bryony had a Barbie t-shirt that we'd gone and bought her, and a pink cardigan. And we were all like here, and no, n- not a lot of other people wore pink. But anyway, look at this yarn. Though. But here's the yarn. Look, I dyed up some Barbie-inspired yarn. Oh, isn't it sweet? So I use lots of pinks. I couldn't tell, I, I don't have a recipe for this, unfortunately, because I just wanted this one skein. And I just threw in loads of different pinks. The main bright pink that you're probably seeing is Landscapes Galar, which is a fantastic pink. And then I, I also flashed in a little bit of gold ochre because that gave me sort of orangey tones. And then also a bit of purple, violety purple. Because I think although it's pink, it's nice to have a bit of contrast, high points, low points, when you're knitting through something. And to, to have orangey pinks and then a bit more, and then a bit of violet as I'm going to be knitting through it, I think it'll be fun. I did cast this on because I bought some new needles as well at the same time. I just did a random search, right, for pink double pointed needles, not thinking that I would find any. Well, I did. They exist. And it's from these people. Licker? Licky? Oh, I don't know. That. (laughs) And they're called Blush. That ain't Blush, everybody. That pink is more Blush. You know, the back, this pink here. This is not pink. It's not Blush. But I didn't mind. It's more of a neon pink. They're wooden. And I bought two sets of these. I couldn't find two sets in one shop. So I bought one set from one shop and one set from another shop, both in this country. But one set that I'm using actually on a different project, I'll show you next time, the points are much nicer. This set, the points are not as nice. They look okay. They're just not quite as pointy as the other set. But lovely, I do have a few things to say about these needles, but I'll save that for next time. I think you should save them for a review, I will. But can you see the issue I had? My needles were exactly the same colour as my yarn. So I did cast on, but I just thought, I can't do this. They're too close. So she cast off. So I undid it and I'm using the needles in a different project. But I will use this, but I'll just use metal needles. But really, it was the joy of dyeing it. That's what I wanted to do. If you saw me smiling like an absolute idiot about two minutes ago, that's because I was just glancing outside. You can actually hear the rain on the the window. The rain's pounding. I I was imagining my wonderful wife on a lovely walk. I've got to go for a walk Which yesterday. she's going to be going in just a minute. And I've got to go. I can't yes. not go just because it's raining. Just change your trousers when you get home. Enjoy it. And seriously. I went I went for a walk the other day, right? And it, it wasn't predicted to rain. Well, it never is. It wasn't predicted to rain when we were walking to see Barbie. But oh yes, it did. <laughs> it did. So I, I had my raincoat on, which has a hood. And it started to absolutely hammer down. So I put my hood up. By the time I got home, my leggings... I could have wrung them out like this. They were drenched. And I thought, I was so mad. And I walked in the door and I I said to myself, I know Dan's going to make a funny comment about this. He's going to try and make a joke out of this and I'm so mad. And he did. And I said, I knew you were going to try and make a joke out of it. And stormed out of the room. 
<laughs> so she's much. just gone and got changed. I you? know, I know. So I don't know what I'm going to do today, but hey ho. Well, what you do is you put on your long raincoat, like I'm you said. I'm putting on you Brian's go for your long walk. raincoat. You do the things which you need to do to keep yourself fit and, and yes. young and healthy. And then when you get home, you change your trousers. Change my trousers. Boom. I'm, I'm not going to be defeated by rain. No. No. There get you yourself go. out there for a walk. You could also Doesn't take the big brolly if you wanted to. Well, I'll take a brolly. No, yeah. um, the, it's a bit heavy, the big one. Yeah. <laughs> She can't manage it. She can't manage to. Well, I don't know. Now you've said that, I think the big brolly might be good because it would the canopy would Correct. cover me, and Hence the I reason. might not get as wet. That's right. That's why I suggested it. I might take the big brolly. But everybody. what you should do is rest it on your shoulder. Oh, good idea. Yes, there you go. I'm gonna look a right sight, aren't I? No, you're not. That's what people do. That's what people do. <laughs> Look, folks, don't miss our next radio show. It'll be out on the 10th of August for Baker Bear patrons, yep. the 11th of August for the rest of the world, and we'll see you on the 25th of August for our next video show, which will feature the rise and fall of the monasteries. Yes. Thanks for watching, everyone. Have a lovely time. We'll see you next see you time. See you soon. Bye. Bye. Who's it sitting and knitting? It's Dan and Kay, the Baker Repairs. Enthusiasm's not quitting. It's Dan and Kay, the Baker Repairs. They'll take you to fabulous places of which their favorites they'll share. You better buy a pad and get yourself a bakery repair. You'll find yourself in a castle while watching the bakery repairs. It never feels like a hassle to sit and watch the bakery repairs. What's on your shelf or what's in your mind?